Take a very good evening to each and every one of us. Abigail Marshall Katung is my name. I am the elected member in Leeds City Council and also um, the NEC rep for the Cooperative Party for England North. So very welcome to each and every one of you again today on our Co-op Live um, series that we have been having in the party. It is with great delight that we're inviting you today. And so with great delight that we are um, having our session today on what councils can do to tackle household food insecurity. And I am really proud to have two colleagues with me here from Sustain who are going to be um, giving us some really good examples and hoping that each and every one of you, especially if you're all elected members on this, uh, on this call today, that you will be taking back to your councils and emulate the very good practices that they are having, um, they would be telling us about today on how we can tackle um, food insecurity. So uh, we all know um, as a cooperative party, we have been long campaigning for food justice and encouraging councils to appoint food champions. We're also encouraging councils to set up food partnerships and promoting and campaigning on a healthy, on, on healthy start. So Sustain today will cover what councils and food champions like myself can do to tackle household food um, security. And they're gonna be telling us about different approaches today. There'll be the cash first approach. They'll also be talking about local support to um, um, projects that go beyond the food bank. They would also be telling us about food partnerships in every local authority, as well as also encouraging local authorities to um, establish food partnerships and food poverty action plans and alliances. So um, without further ado, I would like to introduce our very first speaker, a lovely lady called Sophia Parente. Sophia provides strategic oversight program and staff management to local action projects and campaigns at Sustain. So Sophia has been working at Sustain since 2015. And during that time, she has driven local and national action on key food issues, issues for the Sustainable Food Places Network, amplifying the voice of members at a national level and advocating on specific issues where local priorities need national action. Now, Sophia's background is in animal welfare, food environmental campaigner in the charity and voluntary sector. So I am so proud to introduce Sophia now um, to the rest of you. Thank you so much for joining us, Sophia, and over to you. Thank you very much, Abigail, and thank you for that introduction. And uh, can I just commend you on the work you're doing in Leeds? And I, have the, I had the pleasure of meeting you in Leeds two weeks ago when you announced some really groundbreaking commitments from the council on ways to reduce the environmental impact of food that the council buys. So um, great job there. Um, and I would like to share a, a presentation with everyone. Um, and um, let me just load that quickly. Here we go. So I will be delivering this presentation with my colleague, Isabel Rice. She's the food poverty campaign coordinator at Sustain. And she's really the, the expert and the person that is uh, working with a lot of, of, of councils, particularly in, in London, um, on ways to tackle household food insecurity. But for those who don't know Sustain, I'll, I'll give you a brief introduction. So we're a UK wide alliance of organizations. We have over a hundred members and together we campaign for better food and farming. So our vision really is for everyone to have access to healthy and sustainably produced food that uh, protects people, animals and our planet. So we believe in a fairer food system. So fairer for for farmers and those that work in the food industry, because we realize that they are often underpaid and undervalued. So fairer for people and communities that access the food that is produced and fairer for the planet and nature. And the way we work on, on food insecurity is very much in the first theme of our strategy, which is good food for all. So this means that everyone should have the right to healthy and affordable food. Um, so for people experiencing food poverty, we think everyone should be able to access a healthy diet. 
Um, and this means to improve food in schools, in hospitals, meals on wheels, etc. But also to com combat excessive advertising and marketing and those pressures that make us buy unhealthy food. Obviously, we cannot see this in isolation to a sustainable farming and fishing sector. So who, how much are we paying for that food? Is that enough to reward our farmers and to ensure they make a decent living? We cannot extricate that from the climate and nature emergency that we're living at the moment, or a, a vibrant, diverse good food economy, or creating a good food movement at a local level. So we don't see things in isolation. And in terms of how we deliver on that strategy, it's through national policy campaigns and public affairs, and it's through local initiatives, uh, policy and building a good food movement at a local level. So you will hear uh, some of, of the initiatives we run uh, in this context. And um, I feel that I, I almost don't need to do this introduction, but it's, it's 6.30 in the afternoon, this is why we're here, and everyone and uh, every one of you uh, on this call uh, is seeing this in your neighborhoods. We're seeing unprecedented amount of, of, of people uh, facing hardship. Um, in the latest Food Foundation Food Insecurity Tracker, um, we found there's now 17.7% .7 of households experiencing one form or another of food insecurity. And we know this is even higher in households with children. It's 24% in households with children. And it's even higher in households with uh, people with disabilities, people of color. So it's as high as 42% of households uh, with, with, with a person with disability. So this is now so entrenched, the government actually started to measure food bank usage. And this is now in the official statistics. I think uh, this is a sad moment. I think you will agree. And now the latest family resources survey, this is where government started to collect these figures. 3% of the population is found to have used um, food banks in the last 12 months. But this is really just the tip of the iceberg because we know that proportion is much higher uh, in households um, uh, receiving universal credit. And... Um, and really, we know that food banks are just one type of food aid that people use. There are many other types of food aid projects proliferating that are not even captured in these figures. Um, and charities and local authorities and people in this call, I think we're all struggling to meet this demand. Um, and, and we really uh, commend people that are trying to feed people in need through uh, charitable aid projects. But we have to recognize that the root causes for food poverty are much deeper and need to be addressed uh, at a national and local level. So, and then the type, and the type of, of, of food that ends up in food banks, often surplus food from supermarkets, is this is really not a solution um, for, for food insecurity. And, it's also scarce these days. So projects tell us that they're really uh, struggling to meet demand using the surplus food that is available in the system. And, and surplus also has unintended consequences. It's what's left over from supermarkets. So it's not nutritional, it's fueling obesity. Um, it, it's not providing dignity and choice if it's just offered to people. And it can deepen poverty in an area because um, it, it's actually dampening down um, existing food businesses. So we do have um, some solutions, some, some options for what councils can do. And this is derived from much of the work we do uh, with councils and others in our local networks, including the Sustainable Food Places Network and the, the 33 London councils. So this is where I'll pass on to Isabel because she's the one working with, with a lot of the councils on these matters. Thanks, Sophia. So I'm sure a lot of you will have heard the, the term cash first approaches, and this is an area that is really um, kind of common that anti-poverty charities and food aid charities are campaigning about. So put in bold there is a statement that might 
seem a bit obvious key to tackling food poverty is having enough money to buy what you need but I think sometimes food poverty can be talked about separately to poverty when really it's a symptom of, of wider poverty and it's really important to be campaigning and talking about changes that need to happen at the national level so systemic changes to areas like social security payments and wages making sure they actually match the cost of living and are in line with inflation so that people can afford to buy the things that they need in a dignified way and helping to address root causes of poverty but there's also actions around this that can be taken at a local level that are really important so things like paying the living wage in an area making sure wages actually pay enough for people to live off funding good wraparound services so councils funding things like welfare and financial services debt advice well-being support for people um, having crisis grants things like the household support fund being paid to people who are in need in a timely manner so that they can then go and buy the food that they need and other strategies around income maximization things like reducing taxes the next slide please um, and some of you might be familiar with the work of the Independent Food Aid Network, who've done quite a lot of work on these cash first approaches as a method of addressing the root causes of food poverty. So I'd recommend going and having a look at that if you wanted to find out more about this. Next please, Sophia. So in my work on the London Food Poverty Campaign, our goal is really, again, tackling root causes of food poverty across the capital. So we do this by what we call the Beyond the Food Bank approach, as Sophia said, recognising that you know, get, giving out um, charitable food aid isn't going to address the real sort of deeper causes of food poverty. And each year we release a report called Good Food for All Londoners. And what we do is send out a survey every year and work closely with councils to we give the council a chance to do an audit across all areas of food that are being worked on in the council and look at the food work that's going on in the borough. And they report back to us and we use that to um, score each council and rank them. And this produces a benchmarking tool that councils can use. And what we hear from a lot of councils is that they find this really useful tool in terms of benchmarking hearing about best practice from other councils and actually using this as a campaign tool within their own area to gain more focus and funding on particular areas that they need to work on. And you can see there some of the different areas that we cover in the Beyond the Food Bank section of this report, which I'm going to go through in a bit more detail. So things like having Strong Food Poverty Alliance that brings together a network of organisations that are working on these issues to think strategically about what's needed in that particular local area. The cash first approaches, as I mentioned, thinking about children's foods and then access for other groups that might have particular barriers or be at higher risk of experiencing food insecurity. We also um, work with other organisations and really promote engaging people with lived experience of poverty around policy making, planning, strategy, decision making. And we've got a briefing paper on that if that's something you're interested in looking at within your council. On our website, we're also looking at exploring alternative models to emergency food aid. So there, there's, as Sophia mentioned, about 3% of households in the UK did use a food bank in the last year, which is quite a shocking figure. But there's we know a huge gap in terms of the amount of people actually experiencing food insecurity and they might be using kind of other other methods and other models of support to to help them with that so things like social supermarkets or community meals um, community cafes and things like that that we're also looking at so if you're interested i would recommend um, reading the report and that's got a lot of local examples and case studies from across london in terms of good practice and things like that so the first thing I mentioned was around food poverty alliances and action plans. So we really, this is one of our strongest recommendations is around strategic joined up working. So bringing together a network of, of people who have expertise and who are working in, in the local area on these issues so that they can find out what the gaps are in the area and what is needed in that area and think strategically about how to respond to reduce and tackle the root causes in the area and ideally this would be part of a wider food strategy and partnership that Sophia will talk a bit more about later so but 
as she alluded to, not just seeing food poverty as kind of an isolated issue, but understanding how that interlinks with other issues in the food system, such as health and sustainability as well. Um, and also these food poverty alliances are able to offer support to local food aid networks and other community food enterprises and projects that are going on, as well as um, supporting with wraparound services that can be attached to those services to help people such as money and debt advice. Next, please. We also really focus um, on children's food. So at the moment, there's a lot of emphasis on school food. And you might have come across our Say Yes campaign, which I'll talk a little bit more about. So this is around universal free school meals, but also thinking about that food being good food. So what's this? Sophia talked about at the beginning what, what we think about as good food in terms of food that's good for people and it's good for the planet as well. Um, we also look at holiday activities and food is a really key time to make sure that children are getting a good source of nutrition, healthy start and the UNICEF UK baby friendly initiative which is around supporting breastfeeding in local areas. So I'd recommend going and having a look at the um, School Food for All website. There's a great video on there that was made in partnership with the primary school. You can find out more. You can also put your name on the map as a supporter around universal free school meals. So this is an area with a lot of kind of um, a lot of emphasis and a lot of campaigning at the moment. And in terms of policy, it's a relatively cheap thing to do that we know there's a wide evidence base that has a really massive impact in terms of reducing health inequality and um, improving health outcomes as well as educational attainment and eco economic kind of outcomes as well so it's it's kind of a no-brainer but it's, it's something that there's a lot of um, a lot of work on at the moment to try and to try and push this and a lot of interest in London particularly as we've just had um, in September there'll be the rollout of universal free school meals for the next academic year for primary schools. So also we do quite a bit of work around Healthy Start. If you're not familiar with this, these are weekly payments that are available that can be spent on milk, infant formula, fruit, vegetables and pulses. And this is during pregnancy and for families with children under four who are on low incomes, meet the certain eligibility criteria. So the most recent national uptake figures show that uptake is around 60, 64.5%. So there's still nearly 40% of people who are eligible who actually aren't getting the benefit of those payments that they could be spending on healthy foods, milk and infant formula, which equates to a 53 million pound shortfall across England, Wales and Northern Ireland of money that's been ring-fenced ring ring for this scheme that isn't being spent. So at a national level, we're campaigning for an increase in value to those healthy start vouchers. You might have seen um, some information about this in the media at the moment so that the current value doesn't actually cover the cost of even one um, tin of infant formula at the moment also expanding eligibility so more families in need could actually access it and looking at auto enrollment to take away issues with people struggling to enroll and then at, at the local level in terms of what councils can do there's a lot around better promotion that can actually increase uptake. So we really encourage councils having a dedicated officer who, um, who works on Healthy Start and ideally a councillor who this is part of what they do as well as that can increase the focus on this area. Um, making sure that you have a target for how much you want to increase your uptake by and a strategy of how you're going to do that, which should include training for volunteers and staff in relevant, in relevant areas. All those things can make a difference. Also, I mentioned groups with additional barriers to access. So we're interested in looking at what councils are doing around this and also kind of advocating for more to be done. So we know particularly for groups like older and disabled people, they face additional barriers to accessing food um, beyond afford affordability, but being able to actually necessarily get out and get the food that they need. So they're at the same time, we know there's been much less, um, much less councils focusing on things like Meals on Wheels, where it's no longer a statutory requirement. And since COVID, we've seen a lot of projects that sprung up to support people actually decline. So this is an area of quite concern in terms of what's being done. Also, certain minority ethnic groups are at high risk of food insecurity and face difficulties with accessing food. 
also those with no recourse to public fund status so they might be in need of support but they're not eligible to um, kind of government support and a lot of the times that means they can miss out on support that's needed um, and similarly this can happen with refugees and migrant groups which can really impact the, their ability to access food and specifically food that is appropriate and meets their dietary requirements. Next slide please. And something else that we're looking at is alternative models to food aid. So I think we'd all like to live in a world where we didn't need food banks, or we didn't need you know, particular projects to help people who aren't able to afford um, going and buying the food they need. But unfortunately, that, that is the world we live in at the moment. So something that we're, we're exploring because we know that councils have a lot of interest in this area and actually a lot of food aid providers and food, um, food services are really interested in exploring moving away from food aid and in towards more tr food trading models. So models that have a more financially sustainable element because they're finding that actually running food banks or giving away food for free is really challenging in terms of financial sustainability. So there's been a big proliferation in this area. Um, and there's also interest in social investment. So things like councils and housing associations um, wanting to invest to support the local area. So looking at these kind of community food enterprise models and what can be good practice and what can be sustainable is an area of interest for us at the moment. So we're kind of exploring good practice and exploring some of the issues like Sophia alluded to with surplus food, being dependent on surplus food and looking at other supplies. So at the moment we're working with four locations in England to have a look at this. So we're working with Liverpool, Brighton and Hove, Berry in Greater Manchester and Wealth and Forest Borough in London. And I'm going to hand back to Sophia now to give a little bit more information on food partnerships and the benefits of these. Thanks. Thank you, Isabel. And um, joining a full circle again and going back to the belief that I don't think we we tackle we can tackle food insecurity in isolation to the other issues that trouble our food system. And at a local level, we think it's important to have a joined up action on food. We think that's important at a national level too. And that's why we firmly believe there should be um, one food bill in every nation and one food partnership and plan in every local area. This is a bit our mantra at the moment, and there's been encouraging um, progress in Scotland, who now has a Good Food Nation bill, but uh, we're still hoping there'll be similar developments in other nations. But at a local level, there's been a lot of energy in setting up food partnerships at a local level and joining the Sustainable Food Places Network. And at a local level, what a food partnership does is they bring together the public, the private and the, the voluntary and community sector stakeholders to, to transform the food system. So they, they build a vision together for what is the future they want to see on food uh, at a local level. Um, this is a, a flexible model. So food partnerships come in all shapes and sizes. Some are hosted by the council, some are hosted uh, by another local organization and some are set up as entirely separate identities. Um, and they, what they start by doing is defining a short-term action plan where all the organizations have a role in terms of delivering that, that vision. But what we're seeing is that a lot of, uh, a lot of food partnerships, uh, particularly uh, since COVID, now want to have a more long-term long vision and uh, produce a strategy uh, outlining their big vision for the place. And uh, they do this um, addressing what we call the six key issues in our food system. Um, so the six key issues are a governance mechanism at a local level. So the, the, how they organize action at a local level through the food partnership, building a good food movement that gives the community communities uh, opportunity to get involved in that transformation. Uh, they work on catering and procurement um, in the public sector because uh, the public sector can have a huge role in moving things forward. Um, they work on creating a, a vibrant, diverse, uh, good food economy at a local level. 
Um, they also work on food for the planet. So um, how, how are we going to transform the food system in a way where we're not damaging uh, nature and the environment for the future generations? And the final theme is good food for all. That's why we're here. It's all about access to good food for all. So I know in many, many places um, uh, 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 that are represented here um, in your local area, there is a food partnership, but if you don't have one, here's an invitation to, uh, to promote one and to support one in your local area. So this is where, this is where we stop and we look forward to hear from, from Councillor uh, Abigail and uh, your questions. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much, Sophia and Isabel. That is that was really, really good to hear and learn from yourselves and what you're doing. And I really hope that lots of you here um, on the call today can take lots of um, policies that they have shared with us today back, uh, back to your councils. Um, as you all know, um, for ourselves as a cooperative party, um, the food justice campaign has been huge on our agenda. And the last few years clearly tells you why we have to stick on this agenda. And first of all, we went into the pandemic and we saw the need for it. And then we're coming out of the pandemic, but then we're into a cost of living crisis, you know, where people are having to choose between food and fuel. So um, we couldn't have chosen a better time to discuss food insecurity like we're doing now. And I will encourage so many of you, you could hear from Sophia and Isabel talking about food champions and representation matters. And obviously as a cooperative party, we started the whole food champion agenda. And I remember in 2020, when I got the email um, from the cooperative party and I took it as a counselor, I forwarded the email to my leader at the time, who is now Baroness um, Judith Blake. Um, she was the leader of the council at the time. And as soon as I put that through to her, she turned back at me and says, right, Abigail, could you be the food champion? And I was like, of course, because I am very, very passionate about food. Because in this day and age, it's just so unfair that people in a first world country will go each day without food. I mean, it's heartbreaking that every corner you turn to in the country, you see food banks. So we've had to look at food, just more than just food banks. And Sophia and Isabel were talking about partnerships. And I'm really proud to share with you what we have done in Leeds with my role as food champion. So we also had to develop a food strategy with lots of partners. And what the pandemic actually showed us was we couldn't do this on our own. Remember, Sophia, you said we can't do this in isolation. Now the third sector came in, lots of food partners in the city. We came together to be able to deliver food to the city in the most depressing times in our lifetime. And since the pandemic, we thought, you know what? Yes, the pandemic is going by, but we still need to continue. And it was at that time we decided to have a food strategy consultation over a couple of months, um, all of last year, until January, where we've now been able to develop a food strategy for the city. So obviously, because we want to go into questions and answer time, I will not tell you all about it, but I will actually um, let all of you go to our leads.gov website and see our food strategy. And I can say to you, it's a good, good example of how food partners can work together because for us, um, food is at the heart of this strategy. It's our vision for Leeds to have a very vibrant food economy where everyone can access local healthy and most importantly, affordable food that's produced in ways that improve our natural envi environment as well as embrace new techniques and technologies. I'm also proud to let you know that we were the first city in 2021 to sign a food commitment on, on the back of the Glasgow, um, Glasgow Declaration. And I'm glad Sophia was there. And we had three commitments. Our first commitment was to buy local and serve local. So we, were in, we, we would increase our food sourcing from local um, um, sellers and make sure that our food is also produced in, in, in Yorkshire and support local business and cut food um, food miles. We also plan to ban air freighted inputs by 2030. 
And these are all commitments in all of our strategy, as well as having our carbon footprints of mills served by 2020. So we also have consolidated our, our food partners in terms of food that's been served in our schools. So we have just one catering center that is ensuring that all the food that is produced provided in our 182 schools in the city are by one provider and really nutritious and healthy food is provided to our children in the city. As part of what I do, I also set up um, with a um, with our volunteer team. Um, what we have is a food pantry of which we are encouraging lots of people within the city where people pay a really nominal fee say for example, three pounds, and then you get food worth 25 to 30 pounds per week. So people come into the food pantry and they feel they're also contributing to something. So what we do, we try and source as many diverse food as possible into our food pantries. And currently we have about 17 registered food pantries in our city. Ours started last year in April and we've just gone over a year now. And on top of the food pantry, we now have an additional service where people can actually pay an extra pound each week they come. And that's going into their savings account with our credit union. And then come Christmas, they have something to take home with them on top of the food that we give them weekly. So for example, if you're normally shopping 30 pounds every week, and you're now paying three pounds for the same amount of food, you've got 17 pounds left for you to pay for something else within your family. These are all the diverse ways that you can encourage um, your citizens to help with food poverty and also fighting food insecurity. So I must encourage each and every one of us on this call today, especially if you're a cooperative and you're a counselor, it will be great that you join our team of food champions so that we can continue to fight for food insecurity in this country and ensure that no child and nobody goes without food and make sure that food is affordable, is accessible, and most importantly, it's nutritious. And thank you so much, Sophia and Isabel again, really, really, really grateful. And we will now open up to questions. First of all, I must ask all of you to pardon me. I needed to tell you from the beginning that we're recording this. So if you do not want to be seen, just turn off your camera. Um, it's come a bit late, but at least I've told you. And it was also put on the, um, on the chat as well. So we're now open to take any questions. And I can see Councillor Arnold. Hi. Thank you so much, everybody. That was a really insightful session. Thank you. Thanks, Abigail. I've got a question for you, Abigail. So um, I'm a councillor um, in Ada District. We're not Labour um, yet, um, we, um, but our neighbours Worthing next door are, and they have published a food strategy. Um, now, just to give you a little bit more context, uh, count, we, ha we have a county council here, so we're not a unitary. Um, so they would handle the um, housing support fund and the healthcare vouchers. Um, so what elements do you think could be picked from your food strategy at a sort of district um, level, do you feel, in the meantime, without that county um, support? <laughs> because they're, they're like turning around a tanker county. Well, yes, I do know it in terms of the different county districts and all of that, but I always say food is food. That is one thing that brings everyone together around the table. It, what you would need to do first is look at our strategy. You know, you know how you all are structured, which I wouldn't know, okay? So your best place to know how you can go about it based on the examples and how we have gone about ours, because it simply came from a normal survey across the entire city. We tried, in fact, deprived areas and areas where English wasn't even their first language. We converted, we, we had lots of translations here from the people. What would they like in terms of food to see in the city? And the consultation was what made us put the strategy that we have together, as well as inviting food partners across the city in the private sector, in the government sector, to come around the table. And we formed a, strat a food strategic group where we meet every quarter.
And what I could do is also leave my email and my contact number for you, um, Councillor Annard, and we could always pick it up after this and, you know, take it from there. And I could always help as much as I can based on the work that I do in my council. Delighted to help. Any more questions? Hi, Abigail, it's James. I put a question to your direct mail that someone asked. Okay, I'll read that now. Bear with me. Sorry, James, I can't see the question. Are you able to read it out for us, of please? Course, that will, it, that will help. We talked about the food pantries, as did um, Isabel and Sophia. Who funds those? Where do they get the resources from? Uh, both in the Leeds case and, and perhaps more broadly. Okay, I'll start with Leeds. So in Leeds, the council um, started some of the funding, and then obviously all councillors have got different pots of money. So it was our responsibility. We, took, we had a COVID funding cut at the time. So the startup of the um, food pantry came from that COVID pot. And as we go along, obviously the three pounds that people pay every week, that really helps. And we receive donations from anyone and everyone who just, you know, I'm always out there asking for help, always ask, out there asking for donations, asking for food. So you have to, you know, you have to be very creative in how you go about, you know, getting funding, how you go about fundraising just to ensure that your food pantry is successful. But the Leeds Civic Council really, really played a huge part in making sure um, we started off great. Isabel, Sophia. I, I can maybe give, uh, give a few examples uh, from the network. So the food pantry model is quite interesting because that, that membership fee or that fee that, um, that flat fee that people pay for an amount of food that is much more than that nominal fee actually uh, pays for some of the costs of, of running the pantry. And it's a much more sustainable model compared to a food bank that lives just of, of surplus foods. So we have um, exam an example uh, that I often mention in Middlesbrough, where um, they've set up a, a network of, of, of pantries, what they call eco shops, um, to, to kind of move, try and move away from, from food bank models. And the, that, that fee that people pay for a much bigger amount of food actually covers um, the, the cost of subscribing to, uh, to fair share um in in the northeast that that they use as the main uh, source of surplus for the eco shops now they want to move further they don't want to stop here they don't want to be so reliant on food surplus so are looking at other ways uh, to source food including uh, food that is grown locally uh, by community projects uh, by allotments uh, etc and uh, they've been able to direct funding from things like household support fund uh, the DEFRA COVID recovery fund in the past, et cetera, to help set up this network. And the advantages then when you have such a network is that the, the, the food pantries can come together and kind of, of strategize ways of moving forward uh, with the model, continuing to develop the model, they help each other, et cetera. Thank you very much, Sophia. And I believe the food pantry model, that's the, um, the um, franchise itself i think it's about three thousand five hundred pounds startup where they provide you with all the back office registration and all of that stuff and then all the branding as well so you can either go down that route or you just start yours afresh which we started as from the very you know um, from scratch without using um the food pantry um franchise but lots of people across the country are using the food franchise um and the, the food pantry franchise which really 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 works as well. Okay, so we've got Joe Joseph. We All can't right. hear you. No, yeah. Sorry, I'm <laughs> just struggling to unmute myself. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, I'm Joe. I'm in the West Country, um, uh, convener of the West Country Labour and Co-op Farming, Fisheries and Food Group. Um, just thinking about what parish and town councils can do, as well as um, our larger councils. Uh, there's a statutory duty to provide allotments and there's a suspicion that many councils aren't providing allotments so that people can actually grow their own food. 
Um, I was wondering really a question for Sustain, whether they've looked at benchmarking across the country, the provision of allotments and the maintenance of the, of the ability of people to grow their own. So we definitely do it in London. That's part of the report, uh, but I don't know if we have a whole UK wide. Um, we've, we've looked at this on a UK wide scale. Sophia, maybe you know more about that. Yes, um, we, um, as Isabel said, we, we have a lot more resources in London and we actually run a network of over 3000 growing spaces. Uh, not just allotments, but other types of growing spaces, community growing spaces, spaces in schools, etc. And nationally, we support uh, the right the right to grow uh, kind of of idea that everyone should have access to to space for growing their own food. Um, and there's now an amendment in the Leveling Up Bill going through 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 Parliament that we're we're trying to push. Um, but we do have a national network um, called Good to Grow, where uh, we invite uh, any local area to start mapping community growing spaces there and to form a network of people that uh, actually can have that role in, in demanding councils, parishes, uh, more allotments, more community growing spaces. So this is how we 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 tend to to support that that right to grow um, campaign, and I can drop a um, a link to the to good to grow um, on the chat as well. Excellent. I think James has also put a um, the link for um, for that as well, um, Sophia, on the chat. So please have a look at that. Thank you very much, Jackie. Thank you, Abby. Thank you, Abigail. Um, we've joined Sustain and are going for bronze this year and started our food alliance a bit before COVID. So the, I've got my list of questions because the things I've struggled struggled with, that in all honesty, are switching from, yeah, I, I'm with my Sustain hat on, wanted pantries and all that bit and it was there, but we were COVID so went with people's hearts we actually went backwards a bit you know the lot of our smaller pantries just switched straight into scooping up any leftover food and giving it out if i'm honest and a lot of our smaller pantries that started before covid are already saying a near collapsing because they've been fair share for a long time and the supply through fair share is going down and and i'm not upset about that because it's everything that Sophia has said it's not the right sort of food very often. I'm a midwife by, by background and have linked in our, our breastfeeding support team into our food strategy and alliance. So how did you go with getting people in all those areas to use their heads rather than their hearts a bit more? Do you have a central pantry that feeds all those other pantries? Because we've been to Lancaster and I can see there's the need to, in bringing those smaller pantries together to stop the infighting, we need the one place where it comes to and then redistributes. And I'm really impressed by your schools bit, but how many are still under local government control? Because the more turn into academies, so it feels like the influence on what's happening in the school canteen is going further and further away over the ocean. And I worry about that. So there you go. Thank you, Jackie. Um, I don't have how many numbers in total. I do know we have more maintained schools than we have academies anyway. So not certain about the numbers, could always check that for you. In terms of the pantry, I must say to whoever is going to start, you must put your head and your heart to it. That's the only way that it will be successful. So the pantry that we run, that's every Friday from 12 till 2. So we started as a food bank at the beginning of the pandemic where the council was providing food to 30, all the 33 wards in the city where there had to be a food bank in each ward. But obviously as things you know, kind of went out of the pandemic, people decided, every ward decided to do what they would love to do. So like I said, um, we have a lot of support from the council. We have a lot of support from businesses around the city. And honestly, um, Jackie, I, live food every day. When I say I live food, what, what I mean is every single day I'm thinking 
of where next to get food for the food, for the food pantry just to help somebody else. When they walk into that food pantry, their eyes and just what they're able to get. Now the council has also commissioned a good number of third sectors within the council that are providing food to food banks and food pantries within the city. So that's cushioning us if you get where I'm coming from. Without that, we would have really, really struggled. So for you to be successful, you need a good food champion behind you, you need a supportive council, and you need the third sector volunteers and the businesses to come around and assist you. Without that, you will really, really struggle. For those who are fighting, I haven't got time for people who fight. I just shut my door and do what I have to do. You tell people who want to fight, go next door, not for me. You just focus on the priority is making sure food is affordable, food is accessible, and you try and source nutritious food. You, the thing with partnerships, you meet lots of people. You were talking about fair share. So we use fair share. We use rethink. There are different food um, um, partners across the country. Supermarkets have been very helpful, but we clearly have seen that as the pandemic, as we're going coming out of the pandemic, food is thinning out. Donations are also thinning out. So that's where you have to say, what's my plan B? And you have to be as creative as possible. So we've currently just added, like I said to you, the, um, the savings. And people are just so happy that every week they come, they can save an additional pound by Christmas, we can also give them something. So you need the will, you need the energy, you need the contacts, and you need good volunteers to, to so that your pantry can survive. Well, I'm inviting you to Leeds, you'll love it. And we also have a cafe, we have a free cafe as well, where we, um, we feed, you know, we make soups and food and different things, and we have lots of people we're trying to tackle loneliness as well because it's all about mental well-being and people just being happy around food. And we give them that from the food that we give out in the pantry, two hours every week, not more than that. Otherwise, we will not be able to be sustainable if we did it every day. So make sure you work within your means and what is practical. Can I say something to the, to the point about infrastructure as well? Because um, I think that that speaks to to action, not just local, but at a national level. I think we need to recognize that the shortage of of nutritional uh, adequate food is probably because we don't have a diverse um, food retail system, and um, our retail is overly concentrated in a small number of very large retailers, and they um, and they own ninety five percent of the groceries that we buy. So there isn't diverse sources of food and there is a lack of uh, local infrastructure uh, like food hubs or wholesalers uh, markets etc that could provide uh, alternative sources of affordable food and diverse foods as well to our communities um, so this is an issue that as an org as a, a national charity we're we're working on as well and calling for more investment in infrastructure. And it's interesting, Jackie, that you mentioned uh, uh, Lancashire, because through uh, the Shared Prosperity Fund, um, they, they just got a, a project uh, approved for a growing space and food hub. And the hope is that this food hub, we call food hub, but it's really a wholesale center um, that will work with healthy, sustainable food um, that's why we don't call it wholesaler because it's it, there's an extra dimension to it. Um, it's about the, the food that will be sourced. Um, and hopefully they will be able to supply to food service, to the public sector and, and community projects. Why not? Thank you very much, Sophia. Yes, Esther. Um, I'm a, a parish councillor. And it's very inspiring to hear people talking about what is happening locally. Uh, we have, I think, one allotment that we're actually responsible for, although there are others within the city, within the parish boundary, which are really active and vibrant um, community resources in effect. Uh, but moving away from that very local action, I've just been wondering about more sort of whether Sustrans has done any more sort of strategic level work on 
how the planning system uh, puts such heavy pressure on how space, when it becomes available, can actually be used for other than very, very um, straightforward things. We've just had a, an 850 bed student accommodation block approved, for instance, within the parish area. Uh, there are, it's going to take up space, which is currently open space, which residents enjoy and benefit from. And it also has um, a, a commitment, a well, necessary provision, which is, uh, I think it's called um, biodiversity net gain or something like that. And both of these things, the open space mitigation and the biod biodiversity element are going to be outside our parish area. We're not going to get any benefit from that at all. That will go somewhere else in the county. That is planning legislation that makes that possible. And I'm just wondering if now there isn't a move whereby uh, when space becomes available in a local area, the planning system should be flexible enough to allow that to be used for community allotments, producing food to be used locally. I love blue sky thinking. <laughs> That's right. Thanks. Thanks. <laughs> Isabel, Sophia, anyone of you would like to come back at that? Sophia, Isabel? I was, uh, I was typing, but I'll, I might as well speak. We actually do have a planning toolkit on our website that supports uh, communities, food partnerships, individuals to get involved in the planning system. I absolutely agree. Um, there, there are opportunities there, but it's often so complex. The planning system is so complex and uh, there might be um, opportunities around revising a local plan, for example, but there's so many spatial uh, strategies being discussed all the time that there's real opportunities um, for communities to, to get involved. So I'm, I'm going to, to drop a link there in the chat. Oh, thank you, Isabel. You've You've done it. Thank you very much, Sophia. Okay, we've got David Gator. You're muted. You're muted, David. That's all your three minutes gone, David. Trying to, you're still muted. Okay, any other question while David is trying to unmute himself? There we go. Yeah, sorry about that, I'll be quick. I'm an, as I said, I live in East North Ants, um, an ex-parish councillor. And uh, I was lucky enough to have a colleague that where we set, set up a community orchard, which is now up and running and going strong but one of the big problems we had there was a, about four or five um allotments in the parish that were wanted to build on now as a parish council we turned them down but unfortunately the planning authority was the district um council approved them so what i would like to know is from the other parish councillors uh if they've ever experienced this or what have they done done about it did they actually be able to change it okay have we got any parish councillor that can help esther you are a um, parish councillor aren't you you're muted. You're still muted, Esther. It well, still. oh, there we go. Right. Um, yes, and we have a very, very strong um, local parish planning committee. Um, and we're fortunate in having quite good relations with our county council planning authority. Otherwise, things would get really very difficult indeed. Um, we're also fortunate in that we have a very, very good neighbourhood plan, only a matter of a few years old. Um, 
but the case that I was just referring to, where um, local residents have lost their current open space, which is going to have a very large building plonked on it, uh, the NPPF or whatever it is, the National Planning System, trumped our neighbourhood plan. We thought we could win something on our neighbourhood plan. No, it didn't work. It is really, really difficult to safeguard local open spaces we are finding. Um, but that may be just our particular situation. We're a you know a small city in a fairly rural county. You would think it ought to be easy, but it isn't. Yeah. And I think that question of how um, the work that Sustrans also does on uh, supporting the farming side of the food supply system is really, really important. Um, and I would like to know more about that actually, but I, I have no answer to the question which was just raised because we haven't managed it yet. Right, okay. Thank you very much, Esther. Thank you for that. Uh, Thank you. Okay, I'll take the last question and that is from Mary. You're muted. You're still muted, Mary. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm very impressed to hear about uh, the work that's being done. I'm not clear about the the difference between um, uh, food growing as a as a business, as a cooperative business, or whether it has to be done on a charitable basis. But um, um, I'll I'll, um, I'll try and uh, uh, pay attention to what to what you said before. The other question I've got, I don't know what the legal situation is. I'm in London and uh, the supermarkets um, that we, local supermarkets in North London. Uh, so I don't, I don't have access to the big information, but as you said, you know, supermarkets are quite concentrated. Um, they still, I thought that the government was putting a stop to it, but they still got the shelves near the checkout, absolutely sh shelf after shelf laden with uh, uh, sweets. Uh, and the, I can see that, you know, the children grab the sweets and harass their parents. And this is not healthy for, you know, for anybody. And, it's, you know, using up money in the wrong way. Is there anything can be done about that? As a, um. Not in our control. I just tell my children, no, yeah. that's it. You know, um, you can't have that. And um, that's why I'm not, yeah. you know, straight. You tell the kids, no, you can't have it. We're here to buy this. And you put nothing in the basket. The mom's not picking up and that's it. You know, well, obviously um, not in my control at the moment on what in our control as a cooperative party, what people put at their tails. But yeah, it's down to the parents if you're down with little children. You don't let your children control them. You tell children what's best for them and make sure your kids have got a fed nutritious food. That's the job of all of us as parents, okay? And the difference between a food pantry and a food and, and a food hub. The food hub, you put food, you know, you put whatever you have in a parcel. And that's what you give to people. So they do not have a choice, okay? And they do not pay anything for it. The pantry is a membership system where people contribute. It's a nominal fee. I mean, for my food pantry, it's about three pounds. One pound to be a member, three pounds for food each week. And you get food worth 25 to 30 pounds. So really the money they're giving you is not for the food, but it's just to help the pantry. pantry to run itself. But my email address is in the is, is in the chat. If you want to send me an email, I can always pick this up um, outside of this um, of this meeting and just assist you. If you want to start up as well, that's what we're here for. We would support you through that. Thanks, Abigail. Okay. Right. I'm really sorry we can't take any more questions. We've come to the end um, of our session for this evening, but just to say special thank you on behalf of the Cooperative Party to Isabel and Sophia for giving their time to us this evening and for the remarkable work that you do in Sustain. We hope we continue to work together and support each other. You know, uh, this, this to me, this is a lifelong campaign. Food is something we have to eat every single day of our lives. So please can everybody make sure you get on the wagon with ourselves and support the Cooperative um, Food Justice Campaign. So thank you very much from all of us here at the Cooperative Party. You all have a lovely evening.
Thank you. Take care.